Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. At question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I remind the Chamber that my wife is a serving officer with Police Scotland. When we opposed the Hate Crime Act, Scottish Conservatives warned the legislation would overburden our already overstretched police. Now that's exactly what has happened. 40 officers a day have been brought in on overtime to deal with 9,000 reports of hate crimes in the first two weeks. Callum Steele, the General Secretary of the International Council of Police Representative Associations, has said this. Police officers have been left embarrassed by the hate crime farce, with some left so angry that they have told me they have never been more ashamed of being in the police service than they are at the moment. He added that officers have been pulled from other parts of the service to deal with these complaints. So why does Hamza Yusuf think he's right and the police are wrong? First Minister. Good morning, uh, officer, can I remind Douglas Ross, of course, that when it comes to hate crime, almost a quarter of the hate crime reports, victims are police officers, yeah. presiding uh, officer. And not only that, from the statistics that we have to hand, many of them suffer the most outrageous abuse, some of that uh, directed because of prejudice in relation to somebody's sexual orientation, sometimes in relation to their race. And what we've witnessed over the last few weeks is, I think, the most debasing, worrying, concerning debasing of our political discourse by the Conservative yeah. Party in relation to the Hate Crime Act. Imagine, just imagine, presiding officer, that the Conservatives had been successful in repealing the Hate Crime Act. If the Hate Crime Act didn't exist, with the stroke of a pen, it would have removed protection against stirring up of hatred for those who suffer racist abuse, for those who suffer anti-Semitism, for those who suffer Islamophobia, for those who suffer homophobia, transphobia, those who suffer abuse because of their disability. What a reckless and frankly yeah. unforgivable yeah. approach for a party that seems more interested in gaining shoddy tabloid headlines yeah. than actually protecting people from hatred, presiding officer. Dr. Schultz. Shoddy tabloid headlines for quoting from police officers. From Let's hear Mr points. Ross to police officers in this chamber. And that's the response they get from their First Minister. It is a disgrace, First Minister, that you are unwilling to accept the failures of your bill and listen to the voice of police officers up and down the country. But if you won't listen to police officers, listen to others like us who have said this bill was too vague. It was poorly defined and it wouldn't work. Now some of Scotland's top legal experts have said the same. Alistair Bonington, Professor of Law at Glasgow University, said the law was extremely dangerous. And he said this, it could see entirely respectable and reasonable citizens prosecuted for expressing viewpoints which the law would allow in almost every other country in the world. And Lord Hope, formerly a Supreme Court Justice and Scotland's most senior judge, said the Act had misfired and described it as unworkable. Like the Scottish Conservatives, Lord Hope wants to see the Hate Crime Act repealed. So why does Hamza Yusuf think he's right and legal experts are wrong? Yeah. First Minister. In, in all of that, of course, the one group of people that Douglas Ross is refusing to listen to is the victims of hate yeah, crime. Absolutely. And that has been consistent for the last few weeks when Douglas Ross has come to this chamber around the Hate Crime Act. Let's look at some of the details. Out of the 8,984 hate crime complaints that were made to Police Scotland in the first couple of weeks of April, the vast majority, at least 95%, have been deemed not to be crimes. So this idea that somehow there would be mass criminalisation for people yeah. for simply expressing their opinion or being insulting or being offensive, that of course did not materialise. And why did it not materialise, presiding officer? Because if you look at the detail of the Act, it makes it abundantly clear that for the new stirring up offences, that of course that behaviour has to be threatening or abusive 
and intended to stir up hatred. So we have a piece of legislation that does, of course, what any civilised society would want a piece of legislation of this nature to do, protect people from hatred. And, of course, it has the appropriate balance of protecting people in terms of their freedom of speech and their freedom of expression. If only, presiding officer, the Conservatives spent more time opposing hatred as opposed to, as opposed to opposing the Hate Crime Act, then wouldn't they be in a much better place, presiding officer? Dr Shaw. Come to use as bad SNP law because of the impact it is having. Victims of hate crimes are not getting the support from the police because they are being inundated with thousands of complaints. We are hearing this from the police. We are hearing this from legal experts. And we said at the very beginning this act would put free speech at risk. And we will all have heard reports of a 74-year-old pensioner who was taken by the police to a station over a dispute with her neighbour. This grandmother was not charged, she had not committed an offence, but she has been punished by the process, exactly as we warned would happen just a few weeks ago. And public opinion is already against Hamza Yusuf's law. A recent poll found that two-thirds of Scots thought the Hate Crime Act should be repealed. So why does Hamza Yusuf think that he's right and the public are wrong. Yeah. And still, First once again, of course, presiding officer, in that question, Douglas Ross does not mention the victims of hate crime. No. Time and time again, he forgets to mention Let's the, hear the very First Minister. people who suffer hatred. You know, in the figures for 2021, 20, 22, there was almost 7,000 hate crimes recorded in Police Scotland. That's 7,000 or almost 7,000 people who've been the victims of racist abuse, victims of anti-Semitism, victims of Islamophobia, of transphobia, people who have been uh, victims of hatred because of their sexual orientation or their disability. And these people deserve protection. And what we've seen in the last few weeks is deliberate disinformation Absolutely. from the Conservatives Absolutely. and many other bad faith actors Absolutely. who have refused to look at what the law actually does. And the law is abundantly clear for the new stirring up offences. That behaviour has to be threatening or abusive and intended to stir up hatred. In terms of police officers, let's go back to what Police Scotland have actually said. And let me commend and thank Police Scotland for the incredible job that they have done, despite the fact there have been many bad faith actors uh, in relation to the Hate Crime Act. Yeah. They have, uh, this has been, in, the police, in Police Scotland's own words, a minimal impact on frontline policing in the first couple of weeks. Let me thank police officers day in and day out, not only for the work that they do in relation to tackling hate crime, but for the fact that almost a quarter of the hate crime reports are against police officers themselves, presiding officer. Douglas Ross. Yeah. Yusuf is describing opponents of his bill as bad faith actors. First Minister, that is two-thirds of Scots who at the moment want to see your legislation repealed. And Hamza Youssef is sitting here saying everything is fine with his legislation, just like he did with the ferries that he couldn't get to sail, the trains he couldn't get to run on time, the NHS waiting lists that grew under his stewardship of Let's the Let's hear Mr Ross. Service. We warned him all of these problems with the Hate Crime Act would happen. We warned the police would be overwhelmed. The law was poorly written. It would put free speech at risk. He dismissed every single valid criticism. Hamza Youssef said he knew best. Now the police, legal experts and the public are telling him he has got this badly wrong. The only person in Scotland who seems to think this act is working well is Hamza Youssef. How on earth can the First Minister say that the Hate Crime Act has been a success? First Minister. Well, again, Dr. Ross, of course, once again misrepresents the facts. The Parliament did not back the Conservatives. In fact, Absolutely. the Parliament backed the Hate Crime Act, yeah. with, of course, the exception of the Conservative yeah. Party, yeah. when he brought forward a motion to repeal that bill, that act. Of course, it was Parliament, as a majority, that rejected the, the uh, Conservative motion. Presiding officer, when I talk about bad faith actors, I'm talking about the Conservative Party. I'm talking yeah. about, for example, the observer who reported that neo-Nazis, those in the far right, 
were organising and orchestrating complaints to go into yeah. Police Scotland. They are, by any stretch of the imagination, Absolutely. bad faith Absolutely. actor. Yeah. Yeah. There are far too many bad faith actors who have been spreading disinformation and misinformation. And despite their misinformation, despite what they had been warning, which was proven to be untrue, despite what I suspect even maybe some of their wishes were, the police dealt with those thousands of complaints and dealt with them well. And of course, only a minority of them of those complaints have ended up being uh, recorded as hate crimes. And, presiding officer, let me say this, that every single one of us stands in this chamber time and time again saying that we have a zero-tolerance approach to hatred. Well, I have to say, that has been sorely tested yeah, by some of the right. comments that have been made by the Conservative yeah. Party in yeah. recent weeks. If you have a yeah. zero-tolerance approach to hatred, presiding yeah. officer, you should be getting behind this act and supporting the victims of hatred. Absolutely. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Thank you, presiding officer. When Hamza Yusuf was standing to be leader of his party, he promised to meet and better Scotland's climate targets. And when Rishi Sunak rolled back on the UK's climate commitments, the First Minister said that he had no intention to change the target dates. This is what he had to say about Rishi Sunak. The UK government's actions in the face of that climate catastrophe are simply unforgivable. What the UK government are saying is that we can roll back on our commitments and it is the planet, it is people that will suffer the effects. And now today, this SNP Green government is going to roll back on its climate commitments. So why is Hamza Youssef following the Tories' lead? First Minister. Uh, untrue. And it's probably, presiding officer, why it's wise to actually listen to the detail of a parliamentary statement before, of course, uh, simply coming forward yeah. with misleading and mischaracterisation of our position. What I would say, Let's hear officer, the First Minister. Is, as the Parliament will hear later this afternoon, there is no intention to roll back from that 2045 date in order for us to reach net zero. In order for us to reach net zero, of course, five years ahead of the UK government. In order for us to continue to have more ambitious climate change targets than the Labour-run Wales, for example. Our presenting officer, we, of course, have made progress between 1990 and 2021. We've reduced our carbon emissions faster than any other nation in the UK. But let me also be clear, this government will not move back by, as I say, a single month, a week or even a day from that 2045 target to achieving net zero. But let's be clear, the Climate Change Committee were always clear with us that the 2030 target was a stretch target. That was clear to all of us when we all committed, when we all backed that target in the first place. But what doesn't change and what won't change is that end de destination of 2045. So what I will say is that the Cabinet Secretary will come forward to this chamber with details of an accelerated package of climate action. Now, what we've had, of course, from the opposition time and time again from Anna Sawa and his party is, of course, opposition to every single measure that we have brought forward. So if he and other members of the opposition are serious on tackling the Let's climate hear crisis, the First Minister. it's time for them not to shy away, not to run away, but to back the ambitious climate action that we will bring forward, presiding officer. Anna Sawa. Officer, we, we voted for your targets, and by the way, and that was such an embarrassing response. I mean, that embarrassing argument might have worked with Patrick Harvey and Lorna Slater. It's not working uh, with the Scottish people. So let's be clear. Chris Stark of the Climate Change Committee said last month that the government's carbon, re carbon reduction targets were no longer credible. And he has been clear that in many areas, the Scottish government has all the powers they need to make the difference, but they have not taken action. And the response from across Scotland to the SNP and Greens rolling back on the climate commitments has been rightly scathing. Oxfam Scotland have said this morning it's an acute global embarrassment. Friends of the Earth said it's the worst environmental decision in the history of the Scottish Parliament. Even one of his own ministers last night described it as very disappointing. And now, presenting officer, we must have the only Green Party in the world that supports scrapping a climate change target. Isn't this why more and more people across Scotland are asking what is the point of this SNP Green government? First Minister. Officer, 
Anna Sawar started his second question by saying that the Labour Party backed the targets. That's not in dispute. The point is, every time we brought action to this chamber, he has opposed it time yeah. and time yeah. again. Yeah. And Anna Sawar sits there and shakes his head. Well, when we brought forward a transport bill yep. that had a workplace parking levy, yep. of course, Labour tried to remove yep. the workplace parking yep. levy. Not only that, of course, their own transport spokesperson called it, and I quote, highway robbery. Yep. He called it a car park tax. That was despite the fact, of course, that a Labour-run council in England yep. had already brought forward a workplace parking Let's hear the levy. First Minister. So under this government, we have, of course, made progress. Whether it's, of course, the fact that when it comes to electricity generation, 87.9% comes from zero or low-carbon sources, whether that's the fact that 75% of all new woodland creation throughout the UK is here in Scotland, whether it's the success of the offshore wind leasing around Scotland, whether it's ensuring we have one of the most generous concessionary travel schemes in the UK, the £65 million we put towards 2,700 EV charging points. And when Manny McAllen comes to this chamber in the afternoon, we will build upon that by bringing forward an accelerated climate change proposal and plan. What is important here, presiding officer, is for those that demand action, that they then unequivocally support that bold and radical action. Failure to do so will be nothing other than hypocrisy, presiding officer. Anasawa. Only Hamza Yusuf could believe slamming the brakes is an acceleration, because that's what they're doing uh, this afternoon. And we already know Hamza Yusuf supports a tax on workers, but doesn't support a tax on the oil and gas giants who are making record profits. Because the fact is, Hamza Yusuf is rowing back on his climate targets, and the Green Party is backing him up. This SNP Green government's failures mean higher bills, fewer green jobs, and other countries winning the global race for clean energy. But while they fail to meet their promises on jobs, Labour will deliver over 50,000 clean power jobs in Scotland. While they cut the money on retrofitting homes, Labour will upgrade thousands of homes to make them more energy efficient. And while they sell off Scotland's seabed on the cheap, Labour will deliver a publicly owned Let's energy hear, generation Mr. company Sarwar. headquartered here in Scotland. Planning officer, we all know Scotland has huge potential. And the people of Scotland gave the SNP a huge opportunity, which they have wasted. Isn't it any wonder that people across the country believe that the SNP has lost its way, it has the wrong priorities, and is letting people down every single day? First Minister. In that very short list of actions that Labour would be taking, yeah. there was one policy that was absent, of course. That was the £28 billion that they pledged for the Green Prosperity Fund. That was the £28 billion that you pledged. So instead of £28 billion, we get a brass, pla a brass pla plaque that will undoubtedly match the brass neck that Labour have, presiding officer. Let me state the facts. Let's cut through the sound bites and the lack of substance from Anna Sauer. Let's stick to the facts. Scotland has reduced carbon emissions faster than any other part of the UK. That's a fact. We're absolutely committed. No rolling back on the net zero by 2045 target. Fact. The equivalent of 113 per cent of Scotland's overall electricity consumption in 22 was generated by renewables. That's a fact. 75% of all woodlands creation throughout the UK is in Scotland. Fact. The only green policy, of course, Labour had was the £28 billion a year green prosperity fund that they have dumped. And, of course, they take pride and the fact that they're risking, their reckless plans are risking, we know, up to tens of thousands of jobs in the North East, all to fund new nuclear power stations in England. So this afternoon, presiding officer, will be a key test when the Cabinet Secretary brings forward an accelerated package of climate proposals, it will be time for the opposition to either put up or shut up. Question number three, Ariane Burgess. 
To ask the First Minister, in the light of the recent report by the Climate Change Committee, how the Scottish Government plans to accelerate action to ensure that Scotland achieves net zero by 2045. Miss Burgess, Miss Burgess. Ms Burgess, um, I'm sure no member can possibly think that that is courteous or respectful behaviour when another member is putting a question. Ms Burgess. To ask the First Minister, in the light of the recent report by the Climate Change Committee, how the Scottish Government plans to accelerate action to ensure that Scotland achieves net zero by 2045. First Minister. Well, that is exactly the package that accelerates the policy package that Mary McCallum will give detail of when she stands up. I won't preempt the detail uh, of that here, but the Scottish Government is very appreciative, very grateful to the Independent Climate Change Committee for their latest advice. We, re we welcome the recognition of where we have made progress, but we also take extremely seriously the fact that we have not made the progress that we've needed to, do, to make in order to, to, to get to that 2030 uh, target. It has been made clear by the Climate Change Committee that, that target uh, is uh, beyond what we are able to achieve, and that is why, again, Mary McCallum will come to this Parliament, uh, to this chamber, in the afternoon to give details of the accelerated policy package that we will bring forward. But we remain absolutely committed to ending Scotland's contribution to climate change in a just and fair way by 2045. A reminder, that is five years ahead of the rest of the UK. The Cabinet Secretary for uh, the Wellbeing Economy for Net Zero and Energy will make a statement to Parliament this afternoon on, that, on the response to the Climate Change Committee's report. And again, the fundamental premise of that uh, statement will be around uh, the accelerated response response to the climate emergency. Ariane Burgess. One positive from the Climate Change Committee report was its praise for our programme to deliver greener, warmer homes through an upcoming heat and building bill as a template for the rest of the UK to follow. We've already seen opposition parties in this chamber call for climate action, but then corral the full forces of climate denialism as soon as we propose any change to business as usual. So can I ask the First Minister how his government will build support for our heat and buildings proposals and ensure everyone in Scotland can benefit from greener, warmer homes? First Minister. Well, Annie Aaron Burgess is, is, of course, entirely uh, right. That is symptomatic of an opposition who continue to demand action, and every time we bring forward action, they oppose it yeah. for opposition's sake. And people will absolutely see through that time and time again. So this afternoon, when we come forward with further proposals, detailed proposals on how we intend to accelerate our response to tackling the climate emergency, people will be watching to hear whether or not the opposition mm -hmm. back those radical yeah. proposals or, of course, they're just full of more hot air. So we'll continue to develop our proposals for a heat and buildings yeah. bill to tackle climate change, ensure that everybody in Scotland has a warm affordable house to live in. Uh, the recent consultation on those proposals drew nearly, nearly uh, 1,700 responses. We're now obviously analysing uh, those, and feedback will be published uh, shortly uh, later uh, this year. The proposals are a critical part of our response to the climate crisis, and it's welcome that they've been recognised as a template for the rest of the UK. Maurice Golden. Thank you, President Officer. World-leading climate change targets being delivered by bad faith actors in the form of the Scottish Government was always going to be a challenge. And so it has proved with eight of the Scottish Government's last 12 emissions targets failed, an embarrassing record. And now it appears the SNP and Greens are considering scrapping annual targets in order to hide their shambolic record. So, Will the First Minister rule that out, or is his government now retreating in the fight against climate change? First Minister. What a cheek, what a brass neck from a party, of yeah, course, absolutely. that has decided it will be approving hundreds of new oil and gas licences without any question whatsoever, presiding officer. Absolutely. Cheek from a party, of course, his own net zero Let's targets are behind the ours. First We're Minister. five years ahead of where the rest of the UK is in relation to our ambitions around net zero. And I go back to my central point, presiding officer. People will be watching that when we bring forward that accelerated package of climate action, will it have the backing of the opposition, who time and time again, particularly the Conservatives, who time and time again demand we take action 
then opposed the workplace parking levy, opposed DRS, opposed heat in buildings, opposed every single measure we bring forward to this chamber. And that, presiding officer, is a demonstration of how unserious they are about how complacent they are when it comes to the climate emergency, presiding officer. Stuart McMillan. Thank you, President Officer. This week's memorandum of understanding between Hyundai Scottish Enterprise and Highlands and Islands Enterprise is a vote of confidence in Scotland as a strategic hub for offshore wind, a crucial element of our journey to net zero. Can the First Minister outline what support the Scottish Government is offering to the offshore wind industry to secure jobs and investment that will support Scotland's economy? First Minister. Well, I was very pleased to see the signing of the MOU between Hyundai Heavy Industries and an enterprise industry is a real demonstration that through Scotland in particular, Scotland's offshore wind sector is attracting global attention. The Offshore Wind Industry Council has predicted jobs in the sector in the UK could grow to over 100,000 by 2030. That is why we're investing up to 500 million to anchor our offshore wind supply chain in Scotland, acting as a catalyst for further private sector investment to ensure the Scottish workforce, businesses and communities all benefit from offshore renewables revolution. Collaborations such as this are, are, very, are undoubtedly vital, key in fact to delivering wider economic supply chain benefits to help power, power Scotland's green uh, growing economy. So we will continue to work together closely with our enterprise agencies and with SNIB, the Scottish National Investment Bank, to foster relationships with global industry partners. Question number four, Keith Brown. To ask the First Minister what impact the Scottish Government considers this month's changes to UK migration rules will have on the seasonal workforce in Scotland as the soft fruit sector begins to prepare for the summer season. First Minister. Well, the UK Government's policies to reduce net migration are an example of decisions that are taken at Westminster which directly work against Scotland's vital national interests. Increasing the skilled worker <coughs> visa threshold from 26,200 to 38,700 makes no sense whatsoever for Scotland and I suspect many parts of the UK as a whole. It will limit labour migration in areas of Scotland that already face significant challenges around depopulation. So although the increase in the salary threshold does not currently affect seasonal horticultural and poultry workers, migrant workers play a vital role right across, across the breadth of our entire economy. These changes could cause irreparable damage to the food supply chain and to the sustainability of a rural economy. And it's only with independence that we would have the ability to devise a humane, principled approach to migration that is needs-based and delivers positive outcomes for Scotland's communities, public services uh, and our society more generally. Keith Brown. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for that answer and say that every day we hear about the harm that Brexit is caus uh, causing the Scottish and indeed the UK economy, with a cost now estimated at £140 billion. Pounds. I say that, but of course there is also a conspiracy of silence amongst the Unionist parties who will not raise a word of concern or criticism about the effect that Brexit is having. I, along with other members of the Parliament's SEAC committee, visited uh, an exporter today who said it is utterly exhausting trying to deal with the new burdens that Brexit imposes. Mm -hmm. He talked about businesses which have gone bust overnight, some which no longer export it anymore. <laughs> Scotland's uh, rural industries and constituencies like mine are bearing the brunt of Brexit. These new migration rules are just the latest in a long list of toxic Tory Westminster policies. Yeah. A Labour Westminster government, of course, would do nothing to change this. It would keep Scotland out of the EU, out of can, the single market. Can I have a without... question, Mr Brown? And without freedom of movement. Does the First Minister agree that the change Scotland needs is not a change of a government at, Scotland, at Westminster, but the change that only independence can bring? First Minister. Well, there's simply no doubt that Brexit uh, is relentless. The damage of Brexit has been relentless, uh, and so are uh, the impacts that are being faced right across the labour market by Brexit. Um, new import controls came into effect that threatened to cause hikes to food prices once again. That is on top of, of course, the Conservatives' mishandling of the economy, which has seen food prices rise to levels that have caused such suffering and such misery. Changes to migration policy, combined with the loss of people coming from the EU to live and work in Scotland, uh, make it harder for key sectors – social care, agriculture, hospitality – to recruit and, crucially, to retain vital staff. Keith Brown is absolutely right. Tory policy on migration is absolutely toxic. The sooner Scotland is free of a Tory government, then the better. But of course, Labour 
Labour, of course, offer little change on the big issues like rejoining the European Union, a Labour Westminster government will change absolutely nothing. And it's only with independence will we once again rejoin the European Union yeah. and have that free movement of people. Question number five, Craig Hoy. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's response is to reports of significant financial pressures within NHS Lothian and NHS Borders. First Minister. This year's budget, of course, provides an increase of over half a billion pounds to our NHS boards, taking our total investment to boards to 14. 0.2 billion, of course, the NHS and social care budget as a whole to over 19.5 billion. This represents uh, the, the 14.2 billion represents a real terms uplift for NHS in Scotland, in stark contrast, of course, to England, where the Tories have shamefully cut funding to the NHS in real terms. So, despite our significant investment, we know the system is under extreme pressure as a result of the ongoing impacts of COVID and, of course, many other impacts. Uh, as well. Uh, the Scottish Government is in ongoing contact with all of our boards, including NHS Lothian and NHS Borders, to address the financial challenges that they face. This includes scrutiny and challenge of financial plans and agreeing to support recurring savings where we can to ensure financial sustainability. Craig Hoy. On the 16th of December 2021, Hamza Yusuf told this Parliament, and I quote, every member recognises the importance of Eddington Hospital being at the heart of the local community. He said, I reiterate that and I understand that, and I know that NHS Lothian understands it too. But last month, as a result of an SNP cash crisis, NHS Lothian announced the permanent closure of beds at the Eddington, along with the Abbey Care Home in North Berwick and the Belhaven Hospital in Dunbar. Meanwhile, local primary care providers have announced they are facing massive increases in NHS Lothian's facilities management fees, with Trinent facing the loss of 3,500 GP appointments as a result. So before the First Minister blames someone or something else, will he finally take responsibility for the crisis he, himself and his government has created in Scotland's NHS? First Minister. The uh, audacity, presenting officer Craig Hoy standing up here, shedding crocodile tears for our NHS, while his party has cut and is cutting our capital budget by $1.3 billion. That's capital, in, that's capital funding that could of course be used and should of course be used on health infrastructure projects. What a sight it is to behold, to have Craig Hoy and the Conservatives demand we spend more money while at the same time they've cut not just a capital budget but a resource budget in real terms by five hundred million pounds, presiding officer. And there are of course pressures on our NHS. That's why we've taken a different course of action to the Conservative UK Government. The Conservative UK Government have prioritised tax cuts for the wealthy at the expense of the NHS. While we're asking those who earn the most, those on, for example, an MP salary, those on a First Minister's salary, to pay more so that we can provide more funding, record funding to our public services like the NHS. And that's the difference between the Conservatives and the SNP. And I make no apologies for it, Presiding Officer. Question number six, Pauline McNeill. To ask the First Minister whether he provides an update on what discussions the Scottish Government has had with the Lord Advocate regarding the exoneration of Scottish sub-postmasters and mistresses whose convictions were based on evidence from the Post Office Horizons computer system. First Minister. Of course, as the, the member uh, knows, the role of the Lord Advocate as head of systems of prosecution is an independent function. And nonetheless, of course, uh, I hope she's assured by the fact that Justice Secretary and I have had a number of discussions with the Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General, uh, as I say, on a number of occasions. We continue to press the UK Government to extend their bill to cover sub-postmasters and mistresses here in Scotland, and uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice has written to them today with suggested amendments to achieve this, and happy for that letter to be uh, made uh, public. Uh, if the UK bill is not extended, we will introduce Scottish legislation, of course, while well, Scottish legislation can absolutely be introduced it will need to be passed after the UK government bill, uh, after the UK bill has been passed. That has, that, that's essential so that we can take account of any amendments that are made during the passage at Westminster. This is to ensure that there is compatibility with UK legislation, because of course the compensation scheme is a UK compensation yeah. scheme over which the Scottish Parliament and certainly the Scottish government has no responsibility or power over. Yeah. Colleen McNeill. From recent coverage in the press, what we now know is that people at the top of the post office lied all the way 
about Horizon and down to our Crown Office. But the Crown Office accepted an interim report by the accountancy firm Second Sight as corroboration that the Horizon system was OK, despite the fact that the director of the firm says the report revealed system flaws with Horizon. But so far as the First Minister knows, the onus is currently on postmasters themselves to appeal their convictions, and I'm sure we agree that's wholly unacceptable. Well, I wondered if the First Minister agreed with Kevin Drummond KC that the Lord Advocate could present a petition to the Criminal Appeal Court to inform the Court that those convictions have been found on flawed evidence and invite the Court to overturn the convictions. We all want the quickest route to justice, but if that is a quicker route, and it might be, does the First Minister agree that the miscarriages of justice could be quicker dealt with in Scotland where those miscarriages of justice took place and that our Crown Office should be responsible for the actions that they took? First Minister. First of all, uh, can I say to Paul McNeill that I, I do agree with her uh, entirely that uh, the onus cannot and should not be on sub-postmasters and postmistresses who have waited far too long uh, for justice. Can I also reiterate what the Lord Advocate has said previously uh, a number of months ago now, or a number of weeks ago certainly, uh, that she would be willing to, to be able to update members directly um, in terms of the questions they have got, because of course any petition going to the courts would not be a matter for me as First Minister, but a matter of course for Lord Advocate. There may be some difficulties in why identifying so-called horizon cases is slightly more complex here in Scotland. I know Polly McNeill will completely understand this, of course, but the p p post office cannot bring forward private prosecutions, uh, prosecutions in Scotland in the same manner, of course, in the way that they can in England. Secondly, of course, uh, presiding officer, um, the, the, the Crown, as the Lord Advocate said previously, have often been chasing uh, the post office for further information in order to be able to triage uh, uh, horizon cases, and that information has often not been forthcoming. Uh, Paul McNeill will also be aware that in Scotland uh, prosecutions do not simply rely on one piece of evidence, for example, on horizon data. They would have to have corroborative evidence uh, often in such cases. Uh, so then triaging or triaging those cases can be a bit, can be a bit more challenging. So I, I don't disagree with the premise uh, of Paul McNeill's question at all. If there is a quicker way, a quicker route where we can get justice, and at the same time, of course, we don't want to see those whose conviction, convictions are sound, we don't want those convictions overturned and those people then liable for compensation, then we will explore every avenue we possibly can. So we want no delay whatsoever. We'll continue to work with the UK government to do what is the simplest thing, actually, which is, of course, to ensure that the UK, that the UK legislation does apply uh, UK-wide. Fergus Ewing. Signing officer in November, Kenneth Donnelly, on behalf of the Crown Office, in his written statement to the Wynne Williams inquiry, in paragraph 73, undertook that there would be brought forward a, quote, streamlined and expedited process for securing the quashing of the convictions. Why has the Lord Advocate not brought that forward? And given that we all want the aim of the swiftest possible delivery of exoneration of people whose lives have been destroyed and ruined, and in some cases they are now dead, uh, should we not at least, uh, First Minister, uh, uh, publish in draft now the Scottish legislation, rather than let this drift on further into the autumn? First Minister. Officer, again, there is nothing uh, stopping us for, for example, introducing Scottish legislation, specific legislation. We are, of course, working on what that draft legislation would look like uh, in the event that the UK government does not accept what are very reasonable amendments that have been put forward that would ensure that bill is then uh, UK-wide, uh, which we think is the simplest, easiest way uh, to, in order to ensure there's fairness and equity between sub-postmasters and postmistresses right across the entirety of the UK. I do still have concerns about the UK government's approach, hence why I hope they're open to amendments uh, so that we can ensure that there is a, a minimising, if not complete elimination, of uh, those whose convictions are sound uh, from being uh, overturned. In terms of the questions that Fergus Ewing directly asks of me, they are, of course, for Lord Advocate. My understanding is Lord Advocate has uh, written to Fergus Ewing. If that is not the case, I'm more than happy 
to, uh, uh, to, to, to ask the question uh, that the Fergus has put to me to the Lord Advocate and ensure that he does get a detailed uh, response. But I, I will say once again uh, that, there is, that, that, that we are working on Scottish-specific legislation, although I go back to the central point, we cannot allow a situation where sub-postmasters and postmistresses in Scotland are treated in a different way than they are in England in relation to the access to compensation. We move to general and constituency supplementaries, and I call Russell Finlay. Thank you, President Officer. The work of undercover police officers is secretive, sensitive and dangerous, yet Police Scotland is investigating claims that the personal details and photos of undercover officers have been leaked to an organised crime group. So can the First Minister tell me when his government was first made aware of these serious allegations, what impact this might have on policing operations and, most importantly, what has been done to protect officers who may now be compromised? First Minister. I can say, uh, Russell Finlay, of course, while he has every right uh, to raise this issue, and I share his concern, deep concern, particularly uh, in my role, previous role as Justice Secretary, when I worked very closely with the CS Organised Crime Task Force. We know how important and imperative the work is of our undercover police officers. Uh, so there is, of course, uh, this is, of course, a matter that is uh, operational for Police Scotland. Um, uh, no doubt Russell Finlay could write to the Chief Constable to gain as many assurances as possible, but I would say this is a matter that I understand is still under uh, a live investigation uh, as we speak. So uh, I uh, want to thank police officers for the excellent work that they do, often putting themselves in harm's way to protect us. Uh, but I sh and I share Russell Finlay's uh, concern, but of course uh, this would be a matter uh, for, uh, for, for uh, Police Scotland in relation to the protection of officers in terms of when the Scottish Government first knew, I will ensure that the Cabinet Secretary for Justice writes to Russell Finlay with that detail. Clear Hawhey. Thank you, President Officer. Can the First Minister confirm to the WASPI women watching and to those protesting outside Parliament today that this Scottish Government stands with and supports them in their continuing battle with the UK Government for compensation? And will he personally lend his weight to urge UK ministers to bring forward a compensation plan for my Rutherglen constituents and other WASPI women across Scotland with the utmost urgency? First Minister. Also, the Scottish Government uh, has always and will always support the WASPI women and the report from the Parliament and Health Services Ombudsman is a significant moment for all of those who have been involved in this campaign and I want to pay tribute to each and every single woman that has tirelessly fought not just for their rights but for the rights of all women who have been impacted and affected by those disgraceful decisions that were made by UK governments uh, without their knowledge. It is time for the UK government not just to apologise, but deliver justice and compensation for their actions. So I am writing to the Prime Minister, but also the Leader of the Opposition, calling for urgent action following, following the Ombudsman's report. I can reassure members this government will not rest until WASPI women receive the justice that they absolutely deserve. I will look forward to meeting WASPI campaigners after this session and reiterating to them that while they may be abandoned by the UK Conservative government and also, it seems, by the UK Labour Party, the SNP stands firmly with them in their pursuit of justice. Carol Mockham. Thank, <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Chamber is aware that this morning Sandyford Clinic has announced it will no longer prescribe puberty blockers to 16 and 17 year olds, a key recommendation in the recently released cash review. First Minister, members in this chamber should know if this decision has been taken as a result of any Scottish Government intervention. If he and his Government is supportive of a wider acceptance of the recommendations within the cash review, after the poor, indeed woeful, answers we received in this chamber yesterday, will he intervene where the Health Secretary has not and ensure a statement is made in this Parliament to clarify the Government's confused position on this matter and to allow members to have an opportunity to question Government on this very important matter? First Minister. Officer, on the matter of uh, the CAS uh, review, perhaps I will uh, just quote directly from Dr Hilary Cass herself uh, from an interview that she did just a few days ago. And she says, and I quote, the toxicity of the debate is perpetuated. Yep. I'm astonished, presenting officer, that, uh, that uh, we're getting 
we are getting Conservative members groan at the fact that I am quoting Dr Hilary Cass. The toxicity of the debate is perpetuated by adults, and that itself is unfair to the children yeah. who are caught up in the middle of it. The children are being used as a football, yeah. and this is a group that we should be showing more compassion to. And it is that very last point that I wanted to draw attention to, because it is the compassion to this group of young people that has to be at the forefront of everything we do. And I absolutely believe it is the forefront of Carol Mockin's uh, mind and the question that she asks. And because of that, it was absolutely right to allow clinicians to have conversa conversations with the young people that they treat compassionately before, of course, the government came forward with any further statement in relation to clinical decisions that were being made. Now that we've had that confirmation, of course, uh, of course uh, the, the, uh, the Health Secretary or indeed uh, uh, ministers will come to this uh, chamber with the agreement uh, of the Parliamentary Bureau uh, next week or in the coming weeks to give an update on the government's position. There is a process of review that is very much underway, but I go back again, not just to the central point about compassion, but the point that when it comes to the treatment, when it comes to the care that is provided to these young people, those should be matters that are made by clinicians and decided upon by clinicians, not entirely by politicians. Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Will the First Minister welcome the news eloquently set out in today's Herald that Scotland's outperforming the UK as a whole in terms of private sector business activity is third amongst the UK's 12 regions and nations for economic growth, is currently enjoying the greatest expansion of business activity in nearly a year, and what assessment has he, has he made of devolved decision-making's impact in delivering these positive outcomes? First Minister. Well, Kenneth Gibson is absolutely right to raise these issues. I mean, it will be, of course, much to the upset of the doomsayers yeah. in terms of Scotland's uh, economy. But the member uh, is right to point out the news that Scotland's economy is, across a whole range of measures, outperforming the UK economy. I welcome uh, his efforts, uh, the, the member's efforts, to counter those who would talk down Scotland's economic success. Scotland's GDP per capita has grown faster than the UK's since 2007, and since 2007, pr productivity in Scotland has grown at an av average annual rate of 1%. That compares to the UK average rate of 0.4%. We've already heard, uh, in relation to, to, to the question from Stuart McMillan, about the partnership between Scottish enterprise agencies and HD Hyundai Heavy Industries. Again, just one example of the investment that we're attracting here to Scotland. Think how much more we could do if we weren't tied to Brexit broken Britain, yeah. Brexit which has been an unmitigated economic yeah. disaster. If only we had the full fiscal and monetary levers of a normal independent nation, think how much more we could do, Presiding Officer. Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. April is Bowel Cancer Awareness Month, and bowel cancer is the second biggest form of cancer death in the United Kingdom. Scotland's excellent screening programme could, however, be better. Now, the government have signed up to increasing the sensitivity of the current steps, which will undoubtedly save lives. Sadly, they've not yet delivered. Minister, uh, First Minister, as a first step, would you now commit to evaluating and publishing the costs of making bowel cancer screening more sensitive? First Minister. Also, can I first of all pay tribute to Edward Mountain, who has spoken about his own uh, cancer journey, I think, extremely bravely. Uh, he's done it often with good humour uh, as well. Uh, and he's brought together uh, political, uh, all members of the political, uh, across the political spectrum together uh, in order to challenge us, the government in particular, about what more uh, we can uh, do. So I will certainly look, I will have a conversation uh, with the Health Secretary, we will look, we will examine, we will explore what more we can do in relation to the sensitivity uh, of the excellent uh, screening programme that we already have. Because although it is an excellent screening programme, we always want to seek to do what more we, ca we can to improve it, to ensure that we're capturing more people as early as we possibly can, because uh, Edward Mountain knows only too well, the earlier the diagnosis, the better, hopefully, the, 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 the prognosis uh, for the individual involved. So I will look at the, uh, the ask that Edward Mountain makes, and let me finish by once again paying tribute to him uh, for his efforts in raising awareness uh, of bowel cancer and cancer more generally. Jackie Bailey. 
This morning we learned from BME Scotland that more than 600 consultant vacancies are missing from Scottish Government official statistics. Now, clinicians have repeatedly warned of the workforce crisis in the NHS, but ministers have been quick to say nothing to see here. Now we learn that the published data is entirely misleading and the vacancy rate is 15%, more than double the 6.9% given in official statistics. So can the First Minister guarantee that all workforce data is urgently reviewed to ensure accuracy? And will this shocking revelation be the wake-up call needed to set out a credible NHS workforce plan? First Minister. We will always look uh, to see what can be done to ensure that our statistics are uh, rigorously uh, checked through the appropriate means and manners and where, of course, any challenges are raised. We take those seriously, particularly from an organisation uh, like the BMA. When it comes to the record, NHS staffing record under the SNP, of course, we have seen record highs of staff. Uh, over uh, 33,000 whole-time equivalents uh, since September 2006 to December 2023. We have seen uh, more staffing per head in Scotland uh, compa per head compared to England. We have seen more qualified nurses and midwives per thousand of the population compared uh, to England. Overall nursing and midwifery staffing at a record high. Medical and dental consultants up by 68,000 under the SNP, but it doesn't take away from the point of course, there continues to be workforce vacancies, as Jackie Bailey highlights, and that's why we'll continue to do what we can to both attract, recruit and retain those staff. And a key element of that, of course, is making sure that NHS staff continue to be the best paid anywhere in the UK. Yeah. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Then... Um, I'll take a point of order from Kevin Stewart in the first. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, could you please rule on the misinformation uh, that Megan Gallagher uh, gave in her previous point of order around about gender services. Um, to be clear, uh, what has been announced today was not a decision of the Scottish Government. Therefore, they have made no announcement and therefore there cannot be any leak, as was alleged in the point of order. Uh, this is a decision of Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, who I can see have made their announcement uh, through a, a press release uh, this morning, uh, confirming their clinical decisions, decisions that they have made. Now, I know, President Officer, that you cannot rule on the veracity of members' contributions, but surely, when it comes to misinformation, there should be a ruling. Uh, thank you, Mr Stewart. You are indeed correct. I cannot rule on the, generally on the content of members' contributions. Your comments are, of course, now on the record. And I will take a point of order from Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And further to my point of order this morning, in light of your previous ruling and the new information that has been made available through the press on the Government's announcement to pause the prescription of puberty blockers to children and young people, I... Let's hear Ms Gallagher. Thank you, President Officer. I seek to move a motion without notice of the following wording. That under Rule 17.2.1a, the Parliament agrees to suspend part of Rule 13.8.1 to remove the words by 10am for the purposes of the meeting. Thank you, Ms Gallagher, for your point of order. As I previously explained, I am not minded to accept a, mo a motion without notice for the purpose of questions where there has just been an opportunity for members to put questions directly to the First Minister. I have, however, noted with regards to um, this particular instance that members have previously raised questions with regards to the particular procedures. And I know that that is a matter that the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee are looking at and maybe one that is um, potentially up for review. And this matter, of course, can also be raised with your business manager at our next meeting of the Parliamentary Bureau. And I call Pam Gossel for a point of order. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Over the past three years, I have brought many diverse communities into, par into this Parliament. However, a recent incident has cast a shadow over these efforts. During a Tuesday evening Eid reception, attendees were intimidated and bullied into not participating. Yeah. 
it came to light that an executive member of the Scottish National Party affiliated group orchestrated a campaign urging others to boycott the event, citing it as a Tory Eid reception. Despite the parliamentary rules forbidding party political events within the building. This turn of events is deeply disappointing. Such occasions where celebrating Eid, Vaisakhi or Diwali should serve as opportunities to honour Scotland's diversity and foster connections between guests and politicians from across the political spectrum. Yet this Eid reception was tainted by political undertones. However, I would like to thank those who did not give in to the peer pressure and still attended the Eid reception in the Scottish Parliament. I would also like to thank Douglas Ross and Alex Cole Hamilton for their attendance. However, I am disappointed that despite confirming their attendance, I, have to I had to find out first from the community links that Hamza Yusuf and Nana Sarah would not be joining us. It was also notable that not one MSP from the SNP, Labour or Greens attended to celebrate Eid with the Muslim community. I appeal to the First Minister to denounce such behaviour, but unfortunately no action was taken, sending a concerning message to those involved in such intimidation tactics. This incident sets a troubling present for the future events. It undermines our efforts to foster inclusivity and engagement within the Scottish Parliament. And therefore, presiding officer, I seek your urgent guidance on how we can uphold the integrity of this Parliament by ensuring that the party politics does not interfere with the public's engagement with the Parliament, how we can ensure safety of Parliament staff and whether the behaviour of members in relation to this event means that going forward by attending any reception sponsored by members of any political party, we are in turn endorsing their political views. Yeah. I, thank you, Ms Gossel. This is it's not a matter of parliamentary procedure, therefore it's not one that I can rule on from the chair. It's obviously extremely important, though, that all can attend events in this parliament, which is a, a welcoming democratic space, and I'd be happy to have a discussion with the member um, in due course. Thank you very much. Now, point of order, Douglas Lumsden. Uh, thank you. On a point of order, President Officer, uh, once again we have a significant announcement being made through the press as opposed to being delivered first to this parliament by this devolved government. This afternoon we have uh, a statement from the Scottish Government titled Climate Change Committee Scotland Report Next Steps. But last night the BBC were already reporting what this is going to say. According to the BBC, the Scottish Government is to ditch its flagship target of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by 75% by 2030. President officer, I do not know how many times the Scottish Government has bypassed your request that significant announcements be made in the Chamber yep. in the first instance. What I do know is that it is ignoring your instruction, which is contempt. So, President officer, will you consider before the statement this afternoon what action you can take to ensure that ministers finally respect this Parliament? Thank you, Mr Lumsden. I have not yet seen the statement, but I am aware that there is clearly discussion in the public domain, and I will consider this matter before we return this afternoon. Thank you. Point of order, Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Presiding Officer, and it's indeed further to the previous point of order, because when the um, announcement that the census was going to be extended in April 2022, you were challenged by not being able to see what was in the statement because it hadn't yet been published. Would it be within uh, the auspices of your power to observe the statement over the recess for you in this chair over the next hour so that you could make a decision about whether any or all of the statement should be heard before we move to questions this afternoon? Um, uh, yes, indeed. Um, further to my, my response to Mr Lumsden, I will be considering this matter fully over the next period. Thank you. And we will now move on to members... Well, actually, there will be a short suspension before we move on to members' business in the name of Pauline McNeill.